You know, we actually sat down and we added it up. We've had 10 losses over the last several years through miscarriage or through embryos that didn't even become pregnancies or, or through whatever. So it can be a very painful time of year as well. Partly because of what our culture has made Christmas into and the pressure that we put on ourselves does not necessarily need to be there. Yeah, come on. But I want to say that just as, you know what, I think it's important to mention that for nothing, you know, as you're going through, some of you are, love Christmas, it's the most wonderful time of the year, but please don't forget to be sensitive that not for, you know, not everyone absolutely loves this time of year. You know, I think we got to see the bigger picture and not get too focused on that stuff which is not of God. Yeah. Because that's what our society does. They want us to be focused on all of these things, not of God whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, trees, lights, flying reindeer, talking snowmen, Santa, etc., etc. These things are not bad in and of themselves, <laughs> but we can miss the true story and meaning of Christmas if we're not careful. So, what are we going to talk today? We're going to talk about Elizabeth and Zechariah. Now, I know every one of you, when I say, what do you think of when you think of Christmas, you absolutely do not think about Elizabeth and Zechariah. But they fit into the story here, and you're going to see how in just a second. Elizabeth and Zechariah, also known as the parents of John the Baptist. Yeah. So there's the name. So, ah, okay. There's a name that some people know. Elizabeth and Zechariah are the parents of John the Baptist. So we're going to read about their story this morning. So let's jump right into it here. In Luke 1, if you want to read along through your Bibles, we can. If not, I'm going to put the scriptures up on the screen. Luke 1, starting in verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Wow. So good start for these two. This guy is a priest. Elizabeth also a descendant of Aaron. And the Bible makes specific mention that they were righteous in the sight of God. And they, they obeyed and observed all the Lord's commands blamelessly. That's a really high calling. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be even close to putting my name in, in a category that even is near those two. So a good start for them, but of course, there's a but. But, they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. And they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of the incense, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. So there's the but. And this is a big but. If you understand anything about this culture, this was a really big deal. This was considered a disgrace. Elizabeth would have felt a huge amount of disgrace to not be able to conceive a child. Zechariah, you know, would have felt maybe some shame that he wasn't able to provide a child for his wife. And yet we still see him here. He's on duty. He's doing his thing. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But it's important to note this here. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. Pretty healthy reaction when an angel appears. <laughs> yeah. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Wow! Incredible news! Let's see how Zechariah responded. Oh, sorry, before that. Gabriel continues. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord your God. So not only does Zechariah get some incredible news, but this is an amazing prophecy about what is going to be happening with his child. Oh, yes. Yeah. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit 
and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So we know about John the Baptist. This was part of the prophecy is what he's going to do, prepare people for the Lord. But what's this mention of Elijah? For those of you who may not be familiar, Elijah was a very important, a very famous prophet in the Old Testament. And he didn't die. He was taken up to heaven by God, by the chariot. And so the people of Israel were expecting that he was going to come back. Okay, and so this is a fulfillment of that prophecy that John is going to come in the power and spirit of Elijah. So that was a huge deal. And for any of you history buffs and prophecy buffs, this is where that prophecy is fulfilled. And this is a big, big deal for the people of Israel. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is very long in years. And you can almost forgive Zechariah for wondering this. Right. Yeah. But this very much mirrors, if for those of you who know, Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. So when we go to the next slide here and you wonder, okay, why did the angel do this? Just remember, this has already occurred with Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. And someone who's a priest would have known the story and, and known the power of God. <clears throat> so just keep that in mind when we go on here. The okay. angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until this day happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Mm. You say, wow, that's a pretty harsh punishment. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty logical question. But again, Abraham and Sarah, Zechariah would have known that story. Right. He would have known what God promised to them. And the Bible insinuates pretty clearly that Abraham and Sarah were much older than Zechariah and Elizabeth. And God gave them a child in their old age. So if not for that story, we could, you know, we could under, you know, we could say this is a little harsh. But Gabriel is doing this because Zechariah should know that story as a priest. Yeah. By heart. <laughs> and, you know, so the, the punishment, I guess, you have to put it in context yeah. as to why that's being done. Okay, so Zechariah, silent, not able to speak. Let's keep moving on here. Meanwhile, the people outside waiting for him, they're waiting for Zechariah, wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. So we see what Elizabeth is saying. We can tell that you know, to not be able to have a child back then was a disgraceful thing and this is a huge deal for her. That, that disgrace has been taken away. <coughs> We're going to skip a bunch of verses here because it goes into uh, the story of Mary. We're going to skip over that. Verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe throughout the hill country of Judea. People were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. So that's a pretty amazing story. Yeah. Oh yeah. And if you have the question, how is this about Christmas? <laughs> I can understand that. It's a great question because technically it's not about Christmas, at least not in the way that we think about Christmas. But what you need to know is that in just a couple months, Jesus is going to be born. Jesus and John the Baptist are cousins. And they were born just a few months apart. So in our version of Christmas, where Christmas is December 25th, this story might not seem relevant. 
But when we look at the story of Christmas from the big picture, and we see what God is doing, and we take away our, you know, material version of it, this does have a lot to do with Christmas. When we zoom out, and we see a bigger view, you know, we can see what's going on, and sometimes the prelude to the event can be forgotten or minimized. Right. That's right. And, and this is a big deal. So it's important for us to understand how this fits in to the Christmas story. So what can we learn from this story? So those are, so there's some of you in this room here who like practicals. Right. You're like, it is not a sermon <laughs> without at least a couple practicals. And usually those are done at the end. We're going to do them right now okay, bro. because we're going to save something else for the end. Those of you who don't like practicals, don't leave. There's something else. Okay. <laughs> So the first practical we want to talk about, we look at the life of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Blessings are not guaranteed. Right. Yes. You know, they were not guaranteed yeah. to have a child. Right. They were not guaranteed right. to get married. They were not guaranteed good health. Mm -hmm. you know, God gave them a child, and the answer to their prayer is that was not a guarantee. Right. Zechariah was a priest. Elizabeth was righteous, but they were childless for many years. And it makes me wonder how many others were not righteous, but were blessed. Yeah. You know, we can look at this in our own lives as well. Sometimes we look at other people's lives, and they get the blessings that we're praying for. That's right. And it just doesn't seem to make sense. We say, God, what's going on? They, weren't, they don't even necessarily want that. I've been praying, I've been praying about this, whatever your this is, for years. <laughs> Why are they getting that? It doesn't right. make sense yeah. all the time to us. Mm -hmm. Right? Sometimes we don't see the big picture. But here's what I love about them. They didn't quit on God. Right. Yeah. They didn't quit on being righteous. Zechariah didn't quit on being a priest. Right. They, didn't, they didn't quit on their relationship with God. They didn't quit on pursuing that relationship and that righteousness. Although I'm sure they were tempted. Yes. Only human to be tempted. I want to ask you this morning. What tempts you to quit? Yeah, what tempts you to throw in the towel and say, you know what? Forget this Jesus thing. Forget this faith thing. Forget this relationship with God thing. I'm not doing it anymore. What tempts you? Maybe it's, you know what? God, I'm not married. I thought I was going to be married by now. I'm not. I've been praying about it. I've been praying for it for years. It's not happening. Forget it. I'm going to go out. I'm going to do it on my own. Maybe it's kids. You know, you don't have kids. You thought you'd have kids by this age. Maybe it's your health. You know, God, why did you strike me with this disease or that disease or this or that? And you look at other people around you and they're perfectly healthy and they don't even follow God. Right. And it can be infuriating and frustrating. Maybe it tempts you to quit. Maybe it's your job situation. God, why haven't you blessed me with a job? I've been struggling with, with my career for years, and I've been trying and trying. This other brother who doesn't even seem like he's got it together just gets jobs left, right, and center, doesn't even have to try, or so it seems. <laughs> you know, right? We can, start, we can start adding our own assumptions to the narrative. Right? And you're like, forget it. I'm not trusting in God anymore. I'm just going to go do whatever. You know, marriage challenges, whatever. What, what is it that tempts you to quit? Yep. You know, when you look at Elizabeth and Zechariah, they were tempted. They might have been tempted with the challenges they had, but they right. did quit. Right. Don't give up on God. Right. Continue to strive to walk with God. If you've got questions, get them answered. If you've got hurts, get them out. Deal with them. Here's another practical. God had heard their prayers. Gabriel told them so. You know, I imagine by this time, they would have stopped praying about having a child. Yeah. But they had prayed for years before. You know what? Gabriel told them God has heard every single prayer. Yeah. His delay in answering those prayers was for a very specific reason. Yeah. It was a very specific timing and a very specific role for their child that he knew he needed to fulfill. And so he didn't answer their prayers right away, but he heard every single one of them. Do you believe this morning that God hears your prayers? Nice question. Good question. Do you believe that? 
If you believe it, do you trust that God will answer them in His time? Sometimes that's the hardest part, right? Yeah, I believe that God hears my prayers, but I don't know why He's taking so long. <laughs> and we've got to trust that God will answer our prayers in His time. And then sometimes the hardest part, are you willing to surrender to His answer? He will answer every single prayer. It just might not be the answer that you're hoping for. And I can tell you, from my experience, this last one is the hardest. I had to pray about it all the time. God, I know you hear my prayers about wanting to, to have a child. I know you'll answer them in your time. If your answer is no, help me to trust you. Yeah. Help me to not give up. Right. Help me not to walk away. Yeah. Yeah. You know, pray that my faith in you will be more and will be more important and will be stronger than getting what I want. Yeah. Next practical. Zechariah doubted. Even when visited by an angel. And again, we as you know in our human state, we can understand that. But it just shows how powerful our experiences in this physical world can be. Why did he doubt? Because of his age, because of Elizabeth's age. And we experience our life in this physical world. Well, when I ask you, what are your doubts this morning? And how do they fit into the context of our physical world and the spiritual world that we also live in? Because a lot of times, I think when we doubt, we are so focused on the, on the physical that we forget about the spiritual realm. Sure. We forget about the spiritual battle. All we, we can see what's in front of us, but we can forget to look at what God is doing that we can't necessarily see in our physical little box. Let me ask you, do you believe that God can work, will work, and is working in your life? And here's the thing. You might say, well, no, Ed, because God's not answering my prayers. Okay. You might say, well, no, I don't know, because I'm not seeing the fruit of my life that I thought I'd see, or I'm not seeing these things happen that I thought I'd see in my life. That doesn't mean that God is not working. Right. Are you willing to look for how God is working? Because yeah. I can tell you as I go through challenges, as Sarah and I go through the challenge of infertility, God has been working in my heart, right. in our marriage, in my patience, in my trust, in my faith, in my surrender. Right. Not necessarily something that I was hoping for at the beginning of this journey, God, I really pray that you'll give us five years of infertility and ten lost babies, and at the end of it, I'll be a much more faithful man. No, and it didn't even, it was even a couple of years into it before I finally you know, realized, you know what, maybe God is trying to do something else here while I'm waiting on him. Right. Right. God is working in your life. Yeah. Are you willing to look for how he is working? It may not be what you expected or what you thought or what you were hoping for, but I promise you, God is working in your life. Amen. If you're willing to look for it. Let's look past our doubts. Let's look past the physical. Let's look to the spiritual and see what God is doing. Amen? Amen. Final practical. Elizabeth and Zechariah showed faith when they named their son John. They didn't follow the status quo. Did you pick that up in the story? They were just going to name the kid Zechariah. Because that was his father's name. And when Elizabeth spoke up, she said, no, his name's John. They were like, what? You can't do that. No one in your family is named, is named John. There's no one in your realm. You know, that's not following the status quo. That's not following what we expect for you. But they, they, they took a step out of faith, and they followed God instead. They said, you know what, I appreciate your rules, and I appreciate the box you're trying to put me in, and I appreciate the status quo and the traditions and all that, so that's nice. But God is asking me to do something else. Yeah. God is asking me to do something different. Faith and obedience go hand in hand, because we can't see the full picture. Right. right. You know, God asks us to be faithful and obedient. He says, you know what, I'm going to show you the next step 
If I show you the next 10 steps, it'll freak you out and you will run away in fear. Not going to do that one step at a time. Yeah. And he asks us to be faithful and obedient. He asks Zechariah and Elizabeth to be faithful and obedient, even though they didn't see the full picture, even though they didn't know everything that was going to be going on. And the same is true of us. How is God asking you to be faithful this morning? How is God asking you not to follow the status quo? The status quo, even right now, December, Christmas season, very much focused on toys, 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 gifts, gifts, gifts. Do we remember it's about Jesus? Do we have the courage to share our faith? You know, I appreciate what, what Dwight shared a couple of years ago. Closet Christian. You know, it's just me and my little closet. That's it. Nobody else. Don't come here. Yeah. But now he has the faith to talk about Jesus openly in public. Amen. That's awesome. When we talk, we think about the status quo. Is this going to be another status quo Christmas? Or are we going to step out in faith? What is the Holy Spirit prompting you with this morning? To step out on faith and not follow the status quo. Will you heed the Spirit's call? Will you be willing to even take the time to get in step with the Spirit? To get in tune with the Spirit? And then are you going to be willing to have that courage and faith to step out, to be obedient, mm -hmm. and to step out of faith and not follow the status quo? Mm -hmm. So those are the practicals. For those of you who love practicals, those are your four practicals. But I wanted to put them there because I really believe that the practicals don't do this story justice. I love the practical applications of the scriptures as much as anyone, but this story... Really, when you get it, is about so much more. We got to see the bigger picture and exactly what God is doing because it's amazing. We're going to go back to Luke one, and we're going to take a look at right after Zechariah writes on the tablets that the child's name is John. He's able to speak again, and what's the first thing that he says after he's able to speak, and he hasn't been able to speak for several months? Just imagine. You haven't been able to speak for several months. What's the first thing you're going to say? Let's see what Zechariah says. In Luke 1, verse 67, his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. So earlier on, a couple of verses before that, it says that his tongue was set free and he praised God. Here the scriptures give us more clarification. It says he didn't just praise God. It wasn't just whatever he thought of that came to mind. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied. What does that mean? He gave a prophecy, a prediction, something that's going to happen in the future, something that we can look to and see what God is going to do. And I've, I've added some color and some bold to some of these words here, just to help give it a little bit of punch so we can see exactly what this prophecy is all about. Okay. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath, the oath he swore to our father, Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Wow. wow. <laughs> Looking at that, can you see how this fits in to yeah. the story of Christmas? It's an incredible prophecy. And, you know, when you think about Christmas, how many of you think about Elizabeth and Zechariah? Not much of us. It's an overlooked part of the Christmas story. And when you think about Christmas, how many of us think about Zechariah's prophecy? Probably none of us. It's an overlooked part of an overlooked part of the Christmas story. 
but it's so incredibly powerful and so important for us. This is God bringing together from the, everything from the time of Abraham to David to, to the present. Look at that prophecy. He mentions Abraham. He mentions the prophets of long ago. He, you know, we have everything coming together right up to this time right here. Right. It's the fulfillment of multiple prophecies. And some of these prophecies are thousands of years old. I get impatient waiting for my lunch in the microwave for three minutes. <laughs> yeah. These guys have waited for thousands of years for some of these prophecies. And God is bringing them together here. This is the beginning of some incredible things. The beginning of healing. The beginning of redemption and salvation that will continue with Jesus. And he will be born in just a few months. And it will help culminate fully in heaven. Amen. Wow. How many of us have thought of that? Have thought of this prophecy when we thought of Christmas? And here's the thing I love about God. He gives us what we truly need. Right. Most of us are going to open gifts under the tree this year, and it's part of our Christmas tradition. And I don't care what gift you open. I don't even care if it's one of those, you get like, you know, one of those cars in the driveway with the big red bow. You know, that would be cool. But even that gift is not as amazing as the gifts that God gives us. Sure. Because He gives us what we truly need. And what is that? Salvation. Forgiveness. Redemption. Mercy. Healing. Peace. And hope. These are the real gifts of Christmas. This is what Christmas is really all about. It's not about that gift under the tree. It's not even about if it's a car in the driveway with a big red bow. As cool as that is, it does not hold a candle to these gifts yeah. that God right. gives us. Yeah. These are the real gifts of Christmas. And so I hope that you enjoy Christmas. Right. It's a special time of year. We can mention Jesus and it's not weird. Christmas and Easter, we've got to take advantage of it. <laughs> With all the gifts, the trees, the lights, and yes, even the flying reindeer and the talking snowmen, I hope that we will remember the true meaning of Christmas. And I hope when you think about Christmas, you can have a bigger view of what God truly was doing that incredible, incredible evening. When God became man, it is not just the baby in the manger. As cool as that story is, as amazing it is, and we will talk about that next week, but Christmas is so much more than that. Christmas, the story of Christmas fits into the bigger picture of what God has been doing since before time began. Since Abraham, the prophets, David, all these prophecies, John the Baptist, Zechariah and Elizabeth were a part of that. And the prophecy that Zechariah gave about the true gifts of Christmas. I hope that we will allow ourselves to be inspired by that. We can be inspired by what God has done to give us these most incredible gifts. Salvation, forgiveness, redemption, mercy, healing, peace, and hope. That is what God has given to each and every one of us through Jesus and because of Jesus. That is the gift he wants to offer you today and every day, not just on Christmas. But we celebrate Christmas because Jesus brings us all these things. And I hope that you can all celebrate that this year. Merry Christmas.